Hello everybody, welcome. I've been using my silent server for a couple of weeks now, so I'm ready to review it. It is built around the Direct PC chassis D214. It's a 2U unit. I initially wanted to build it around the Rec PC XC235L2, but it doesn't have the ventilation area that I need for the silent power supply. Although the thermometer for a silent server would be very useful. The chassis is great, it's well built, although the corners are a bit rough. I had to go for a 2 unit, U unit, otherwise I will not be able to have a passively cooled solution and I will need to use the very loud 1U thin server power supplies and I didn't want that. The chassis is not very deep and it fits perfectly a mini ATX uh, motherboard and the required components. For some people it may be a silly detail, but I also like the fact that the slot covers are removable. You don't need, you don't need to break them to install cards. As a company, RackPC seems, seems to be great. There was a problem with my delivery and they proactively contacted me to try to sort it out and it was great. I'm definitely getting one of their chassis for my next project and a video introdu introducing this project is gonna come soon. Choosing this motherboard was a very simple affair. I just started googling around to see the best small server board that would fit one 155 processors and I found this one. I'm really happy with the choice. It can fit up to 32 gigs of DDR3 ECC RAM dual channel. It has uh, 6 SATA 2 ports and that's good enough for spinning disks. It has one legacy PCI uh, slot that you can use for old cards that you have supports ECC, it has integrated graphics, so I don't need to use a CPU that has, you know, inbuilt graphics, and that's the case of the Xeon I have. USB 2, 6 ports, dual gigabit Ethernet, so it's a very robust small board, and it comes in the small uh, factor that I wanted, so no big deal here. It's doing its job. One of the reasons why I chose the Xeon E3-1220L is, well, I already had it, but also it has a fairly modern feature set and low uh, thermal requirements. So it's a perfect choice for the build time I was looking for, and it doesn't have all the stupid integrated video stuff, which I suppose makes it generate less heat, and it can actually run quite warm at 77.5 degrees, so I can push the thermos quite high on this one and have the server hovering around 68 or 9 degrees constantly and it should be okay. Well, let's see how it's going to be running in a year, right? But for now, it's a perfect choice. My use case is quite particular, so I'm going to talk about it when I discuss performance. But I see this as the perfect home gateway server. You can use the two integrated gigabit Ethernet ports to connect to two internet providers and install a four port um, internet card connecting perhaps to your wireless access points. And then you can have your VPN server, firewall router, DHCP, even perhaps like antivirus running from a single platform and silent, right? If you don't really want to run storage or games as I do, it could be perfect for your home. This build was never meant to break records. My success criteria is always having it doing its job, staying within the thermal possibilities. As you can see, uh, VirtualBox is always using 100% CPU time because it's running a very unoptimized application and I'm gonna show it soon to you soon. Uh, and as you can see, it can turbo boost up to 2.8 gigahertz, but not any more. The processor allows up to uh, 3.4 gigahertz, but well, then we reach the thermal limits, right? And you can see here that when the power usage reduces a bit, the frequency goes up, so the processor gets hot, or when it's working a bit harder, the clock speed goes low. But that's fine as long as the application is running and the system remains, uh, you know, under 
69 or 70 degrees. As you saw in the specification sheet uh, before, it can run up to 77 degrees. Of course, I don't know exactly what's the impact in the, in the longevity of the processor, right? If it's meant to operate at 70 degrees or 65 constantly, right? But I need to try. This is an experiment. Uh, let's see how it's going to be. The server is not running any, anything critical, right? Uh, besides my syslog server and my civilization server. Civilization 4 had a fantastic text only pitboss server mode that worked beautifully. And when they released Civilization 5, the pit boss mode was gone. But what happened then, after the gaming community protested, they created a pit boss server, but that depends on having the whole uh, game graphics engine running underneath. Which means that no matter what you do, no matter how powerful your machine is, you have it running to gonna eat all your CPU, right? As you can see here in the task manager. So I built this system around, well, it being able to run the game, right? Because I was not very successful in getting it running uh, on my micro server and that has a quad core Xeon, also low power. Uh, but, you know, I had issues with saw Windows on the virtual machine that runs on the free NAS and I had already a VM ready for virtual box running with the game set for years, right? Because, for example, I cannot run it on Windows 10, it crashes, so I had to create a VM with Windows 8. It was not also working with Windows 8.1, right? Uh, so, now that it is working, it has all the patches installed. That's the environment where I run Civ for myself and my friends. And as you can see here, I'm going to toggle the different views. The game graphics engine is always running underneath, and the virtual machine running uh, on the Xeon inside a VM under Linux is handling it quite okay, uh, I'm satisfied. So now and then the game crashes, but I think the developer expected that because it auto saves every turn, so we never lose progress.